Um, so I want to just introduce these guys as they're coming up. Um, two old friends and one new friend. The old ones are sort of bracketing the new one. Uh, Vinit Nayer, who is the CEO of HCL Technologies and quite an extraordinary leader. I once wrote a piece, uh, probably, what year was that? Like 2007? Yeah. In 2007, I wrote a piece with the headline, the world's most modern management dash, dash, dash in India. Because uh, at the time, Vineet had explained to me the managerial innovations he was doing at HCL, and it blew me away so much that anybody would be doing it. And then the fact that it was an Indian software company was doubly or triply amazing to me. And then he wrote a book about it, which is now out, which is, what's it called again? Employees first, customers second. Employees seconds. first, customers second. So you kind of get a little flavor of some of the ideas there. And he's going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, next to him, Rajiv Singh Malaris, who is the head of Asia for Alcatel Lucent, where he oversees 26,000? A little more. 27,000 employees? 27,500? <laughs> um, it's not like Facebook, right? Um, and uh, he, was head of, he was running strategy for them until recently. He's now got this big operational role. He's, uh, he's, he's a thinker. We're really glad to have him. He's based in Singapore. Shanghai. Shanghai. Oh, shit. I I guess I, I ought to prep for these right. sessions, that's right? That's new, new friend. Um, I'm a that's new my friend. new friend, right? Okay, so that's the, thank you. Thank you. He, he, he is a friend. He gets me off the hook really well. And finally, Jeff, who's actually the oldest friend in the crew and CEO of LinkedIn, who I've known since he was at Yahoo, where he was one of the top guys. Um, I think one of the main thinkers in technology. Um, I actually say in my book that he was a candidate to be uh, for Sheryl Sandberg's job, so I hope you don't mind that I said that. that. Uh, you never discussed that with me. But anyway, he was a serious candidate for that. Uh, he, he is that kind of guy who could easily get jobs like that. Instead, he's running one of the, I call it the, the other most important global social network, aside from, really, there are only two, Facebook and LinkedIn. There are no other truly global social networks. LinkedIn is doing a lot of amazing things really well under Jeff's leadership, which is now about a year and a third old. Uh, like over a year and a half. A year and a half. So anyway, Vineet. Tell us a little bit. So here, what are we talking about here? So we're, we're, we're talking here. This is like our only session that's really explicitly about managing, um, which is actually, as a business journalist, something I've written about a lot and that we care about a lot at Techonomy. And the question is, how is the whole techonomic environment, the technology-infused landscape, changing the way companies have to operate and how managers have to behave? So I just think Vineet is kind of exhibit A so what do you do, Vineet? <laughs> I have to stand up and do like this? No, just, just talk. <laughs> Talking is good. So first is that I, I think the topic is uh, it's quite sad, uh, managing the unmanageable. Uh, as if uh, workforce is a problem and not an opportunity. Uh, and I, I personally believe that workforce is the biggest opportunity we have. Uh, before I tell you why I think that, give you a context so that you don't say that it doesn't apply to you. We have 64,000 people in 26 countries. And what I'm going to tell you is, has been applied in that context. And by the way, just had like the best quarter you ever had, right? Yeah. Fourth largest Indian outsourcing firm up there with, you know, with PCS, uh, Infosys, and Wipro, and, and they're the next one, and they weren't known until recently. So we were one of the only few companies in the global IT firms which grew in recession. Uh, in excess of 20% year on year, every year. The first question we asked ourselves in the year 2005 was that what is the core business a company is in? And the answer to that question was to create differentiated value for our customers. So the differentiation of the value we create is, is what the customers buy. Question number two is where does that value get created? And the answer is in the interface of the employees and the customer. Let's call that the value zone. Question number three is who creates that value? And the obvious answer is the employees of the company create the value. Therefore, question number four is, therefore, what should be the business of management and managers be? And the obvious answer is to enthuse, enable, encourage the employees to create the value for the, for the customers. So watch it. Enthuse, enable, encourage the creation of value by the employees and not create the value themselves. And therefore, Employees first, customers second, is the only way you can outgrow your competitors because you can enthuse, enable, encourage the employees to do that. How do you do it? I think the, the doing is, you know, is, is not that complicated. The doing is that by inverting the pyramid of the organization and by making the management and the manager as accountable to the employees, 
64,000 of them, as they are to you, would unleash the talent and the energy of the employees to solve your problems. So how do you go about doing it? I think there are three simple steps which you could think about. First is create a huge amount of dissatisfaction with where you are today. Look at the mirror and, and understand the irrelevance of where you are today. That creates the desire to move on. Then second is to create a desire, a future vision, which is commonly arrived at with all the employees, which is what I call the romance of tomorrow. It is so compelling that everybody would want to give up there today and go to tomorrow. And then small catalyst action from moving from here to there. I just want to end with one, one small point of view here so that you understand, and I'm not going to go into detail, but we will do that over discussion. In HCL, all dirty linen about a company is actually blocked internally, right? And we really think our company is sad, right? Sad I'm using because, you know, I don't want to use unparliamentary language out here. <laughs> but that's one thing we do. My 360-degree feedback, along with 3,500 of my colleagues, is done by 65,000 employees, and the results are published on the web. So there are lots of initiatives. When we get into the discussion, I would be very happy to talk about of how we invert the pyramid, how we make the management accountable to the employees, and what is the result. The results are, as per Hewitt surveys, we are number one in employee satisfaction. We have amongst the lowest attrition. Our customer satisfaction during recession went up by 40% and 26% respectively. We are one of the only few companies which grew in recession by 17% and 24% respectively, and we love what we do. And one of the reasons you felt the need to do it was attrition is such a big problem in your industry, right? I mean, it's, it can be 50% annually in some cases in your industry. Yes, so one, attrition is a big problem, and secondly, it's not the people who go away, that's not your problem, but the people who stay, most of them, we did a recent survey in US where the results have come out, most of the people sitting inside the company getting paid are so demotivated that productivity is only 20%. Yeah, just one quick thing I'll tell you it's the, the, that Vineet does at HCL. Any employee in the company can kind of create a ticket of complaint or suggestion, it could be anything, and they put it in and it's sort of handled by like a committee, right? Yes. But it doesn't go directly to their manager, but their the manager is responsible for making sure that it is answered. But the only person who can remedy the ticket and take it off and say it is finished is the employee themselves. And the ticket could even be, you know, Vanit is a terrible CEO. Why did he say that dumb thing? You know, he should stop going to the US so often for conferences or whatever. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah, that could be it, seriously. Please and, do not tweet that. <laughs> <laughs> David, I think um, one thing uh, that really resonates with me in terms of Vinny's philosophy uh, is transparency. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's so critical in this day and age where employees have access to information in ways that they never had access to it before. And it's been my experience anecdotally, and I, I've also talked to some other folks and, and, and read some of the research on this, but I think the more an executive management team tries to clamp down yeah. and prevent uh, the broader base of employees from having the optics into the company's successes, its failures, how it's going to uh, execute on its plan. Uh, the more folks are going to try to get at that information any way they can. And once they get it, uh, more likely than not, they're going to leak it because they resent the fact that it was kept from them. Right. And you get into a very vicious cycle. So an employee that finds information that way and leaks it is sending a signal to executive management that the broader employee base can't be trusted. So guess what happens? Executive management holds on even tighter to the information. Right. Now you have a vicious cycle, but flip that. Are you that, talking about Yahoo by any chance? Uh, not necessarily talking about any company in particular, but uh, have uh, certainly seen some stuff and, and uh, learned uh, through experience. And I, I think I'd rather focus on the virtuous cycle that's possible, uh, which is the flip side. Uh, the more an executive management team brings the entire company uh, under the tent, um, shares everything, uh, provides perfect transparency and optics into the plan, uh, into what you're trying to accomplish, into what's working, what's not working. By the way, if people don't know what's not working, how in the world are they going to fix it? True, true. And the benefits of this are that people have a better understanding of how what they're working on ties to the overarching mission of the company. 
Uh, they have a better understanding of how they contribute to their team, uh, the broader company at large, and they feel like they're a part of it. And when they feel like they're a part of it, when they feel like they're a stakeholder, they're not going to leak the information. And you get a very virtuous cycle. So yeah. the, the transparency component of your work uh, really resonates with me. And I, uh, can, I, can I just, because uh, you stole my thunder here a little bit. Oh, so so when, when David uh, told me the, the, the name of the panel, I asked the question of, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about Gen Y and the tools that we need to manage them. And so I asked myself the question, what about the people who manage them? And how do they need to change? Because I consider myself in that generation. And I think most of us, or a lot of us in this room, are probably in that generation. Uh, and I, I thought about three things. The first is the most obvious one. They need to be technology savvy. So if you don't know how to use LinkedIn or Facebook, how can you relate to your employees? Uh, they, you know, it's a bit of a caricature. I think a lot of these employees are not the most socially adapt uh, people. The managers. Uh, no, the employees. They communicate in short bursts. They can't write very oh, well. That, yeah. Um, so you, you as a manager have to change and adapt to that. So that's, that's the obvious one. The second one is exactly what you just said, transparency. You cannot hide information anymore. And I think the average manager who's in his 30s, 40s, and 50s was raised in a context of uh, uh, hierarchy, power, um, in some cases manipulation, but the information was not transparent. You will be found out and then you will be discredited. That's very difficult for people to change. And then the third is uh, the one you alluded to as well. <coughs> Uh, bigger context. Um, employees don't really care about, well, let me rephrase that. Some, the majority, I would argue, of younger employees don't, shareholder value is not the main motivator. So you've got to figure out what motivates them. What is it about the world? What is it about the mission of the company? Uh, and engage them in that uh, to keep them loyal. I, I, there was an interesting statistic from uh, a school I didn't go to, but nevertheless, I think it's respected, Harvard Business School, that they predict that the average graduate of Harvard Business School will have 13 jobs over their adult professional life. So think about that in terms of that's what, three, an average of three or four years per job. That's the new normal, if you will, versus I think most of us have had how many, half of that over a course of a career. Oh, Rajiv, you've worked all over the world. You're now based in Shanghai. What is the, is the context different in Asia? I mean, do you, do you find the issues that you have to deal with with your employees there different than what Jeff would be dealing with in San Francisco? Do you think? Um, I look, at last year I was in Paris, so I dealt with the French employees. So that was a unique set of, of, uh, <laughs> of uh, challenges. I think, uh, yes, let me be provocative. So I think the United States is one reality. I think Europe is a probably similar but distinct reality. And I think Asia is uh, dramatically different. Um, I think uh, employees are using some of the tools, but they are raised in an education system that still emphasizes hierarchy, emphasizes respect, so you don't get as much pushback. In China is my experience. A lot of remedial education is required, so it's one thing to hire engineers, and one of the statistics, you know, we talked about it at dinner last night, I think someone was saying 60 some odd thousand engineers in the US and half a million in China. So there are a lot of engineers who can do the basic task, but give them a blank sheet of paper and say, right, redesign this device 50% power consumption, 20% less footprint, it's going to be hard. And that's, that's the struggle I have as I hire, for instance, this year, 1,000 engineers in China and upwards of that number in India. Will they be able to be as creative? Um, and I think the answer is no. And I, I think that a lot of the debate in the United States is going to, about the tools we use is, is not going to travel as well into Asia, at least for a decade. Maybe you, 